and welcome to this design practice 2 module 24. Today we are going to talk about some of the different variants of <coughs> principles associated to micro pumping and then <coughs> delve into a little bit into the basics of one form of sensing which is sensing of gases using thin film elements and what are the basic principles involved in it. So, let us talk about first micro pumps and I am going to show you a set of schematics and describe therein what happens so that you can realize. So, the first type of uh, sort of a you know you can say a fluid actuator which is going to cause pumping uh, comes in the form of valveless rectification pumps where there can be either a passive design or an active uh, design. So, here in this particular case as you may realize that uh, there is a change in the sectional area the cross sectional area. Uh, from the inlet side and the outlet side. So, the inlet side is like a nozzle. So, the area suddenly increases and therefore, the uh, increase in area would signify a reduction in velocity. Okay. So, the uh, continuum assumptions uh, lead us to conclude that an increase in area should always reduce the average velocity of flow and therefore, if the velocity again uh, reduces through Bernoulli's equation, the overall pressure would increase. So, there is a pressure rise and so therefore, this is a high pressure region which is developed because the flow gets slowed down here. Okay. It does not uh, the velocity falls down here. So, the velocity head is converted into the pressure head. On the other side I have a diffuser arrangement where there is a lower cross sectional area which eventually changes into a higher cross sectional area, but because of this lower value of area the velocity head is more. So, <coughs> area here is lower and velocity is increased because of that and therefore, the pressure is reduced. And so, uh, always pressure at this point right here would be lower in comparison to uh, point A. So, let us say this is B okay, and this is A. So, lower in pressure than pressure at A. So, if P A in this particular case is greater than P B, so obviously, there is going to be a flow between P A and P B, which is going to ooze out okay, of this particular system. And so, by virtue of the architecture itself, uh, in a passive manner, if we are gravity feeding the flow into such an inlet, uh, it is going to come out on the other side and create a pressure head on the outlet. So, these valves, these, these kind of principles are sort of you can say actuation principles based on fundamentals of reduction in uh, area increase in velocity profile at different points along a channel and such architectures could be drawn to passively uh, <coughs> do some actuation in terms of fluid uh, you know flow from one end to the other end by virtue of change in cross sectional area. A similar kind of a strategy can be uh, done on an energized basis. So, the passive part of this particular channel is now sort of made active through uh, some kind of a squeezing mechanism. So, there is a vibrating disc for example, just mounted below this channel where uh, the disc bends you know in an upwardly manner uh, thus squeezing this particular part of the channel. So, that there is a throw out of fluid and so obviously, the throw out would be more in this case because the pressure here is lower than the pressure here and so more fluid will be going into the outlet side than the inlet side. So, this is one of the first systems of pumping uh, that can get uh, because of actuation being actively done or passively done or by change in architecture. This is one example of uh, fluid actuation. The other example of fluid actuation is uh, what you normally find through spur gears and rotary pumps with spur gears. So, here what is happening is that there is the inflow of uh, fluid from this particular section and uh, there are rotating uh, and matching spur gears which are being rotated this one in the anti clockwise direction and the other one in a clockwise direction. So, obviously, and the fluid would be transported from this end uh, to the outlet side here and the velocity would be increased because these uh, teeth of the spur gears would act as pedals and forward flow and create more velocity as the fluid goes from 
this end, the inlet end towards the outlet end. And so therefore, there is pumping mechanism based on it. So this actuation is being done through small motors, okay, and fluid gets actuated so that it can um, pump across different domains. There are ferrofluidic magnetic pumps, which are again based on a, a plug of fluid again, which is comprised of some magnetic ferromagnetic material. This could be for example, oil immersing uh, iron oxide particles, something like which does not mix through the overall water which is there in the system and it is uh, activated as a plug. Uh, you can see this hatched area here more acting like a plug and the idea is that when an external actuation is being done through a magnetic field, it magnetizes and as the magnet moves as this particular uh, U-shaped horseshoe magnet is moved in a certain direction, it drags along the plug along with it. And so obviously, if there is a water flow from this end, let us say this is the inflow, uh, the water is actually taken by this plug motion, uh, because uh, the plug will push the water column in upwardly manner on the other side, that is the outlet side, and it will pull in the fluid from the in fed or inflow side, so that there is continuity maintained. And so, the movement of this magnetic, uh, magne this, this ferromagnetic material like a dispersion through an external magnetic actuation would allow for pumping uh, to take place. So, now obviously, it depends on how fast the, uh, the motion is achieved by this particular magnet. Uh, in one direction, if supposing the, the motion is faster in the forward direction and slower in the reverse direction, then there would be a net pumping on the outlet side, uh, so on and so forth. And so, there is also a pressure difference which is being made by this technique, which would lead to um, an outflow of the fluid. So, this is ferrofluidic actuation used through external magnetic fields. Very intelligently, the same principle can be designed in a circular route. Here you can consider instead of two horseshoe magnets, one horseshoe magnet, two horseshoe magnets moving in different directions. There is an inner magnet towards the inside of this loop. So, this actually is a channel loop with an inlet and an outlet. So, let us suppose this is the outlet part of the channel and this is the inlet part of the channel and there is continuous fluid flow through the inlet part. So, as uh, we can see that there is a repositioning of the uh, core horseshoe magnet with the flanked horseshoe magnet from position 1 uh, to further position 2 to further position 3. And so, they come just exactly opposite to each other. And this um, again has a sort of a ferrofluidic pump, which um, ferrofluidic material, which is uh, shown by the, the hatched lines in both these cases. As the magnets are separate, that is the core magnet is separate and the flank magnet is separate, uh, it attracts its own ferrofluidic material and as they come in face to face, the material joins together as one particular plug. Okay. And from here, when the motion starts, the core magnet again starts going in a clockwise direction, it starts separating one portion as a plug along with it, which it drags along as this magnet moves, this plug also moves. And because the plug moves, there is a pressure difference created here in which the inlet water can be fed in. And let us suppose the whole cycle is repeated that this plug moves along with the mark, uh, the, the internal magnet or the core magnet to this position. Uh, what is happening is that whatever fluid was actually in this particular space because of the motion of this plug is now going away, whereas the new space that is being created is being filled with the new fluid. Again, there is a joining action and this cycle continues many times, so that fluid can be pumped from the inlet to the outlet side. So, in a very intelligent manner uh, with a two plug system, this circular pumping station has been designed, which would result in uh, flows again. So, this is also magnetic actuation from distance. There are also osmotic uh, micro pumps, where there is a membrane across which there is uh, you know diffusion of fluids, so that concentration differences are eliminated and the membrane stops working after the concentration on both sides here C 1 and C 2 equalize to each other. Okay. So, this is a 
based on the concept of a semi permeable membrane and the membrane carries out the transport uh, by uh, the the osmotic pressure difference because of changed concentrations across two domains so this is again another form of you can say actuation mechanism which enables flows from one side to the other so uh, then we also uh, look into a slightly different connotation so we have seen all the different kind of actuation mechanisms for causing flow actuations at the micro scale we will now delve a little bit into sensor we already have done uh, some useful illustrations about definitionally how we can uh, put the sensor as really a, uh, a transducer a recognition element you know a, a, a sort of a signal uh, processing system which takes up the electrical signal or the optical signal which is being generated and interpretation okay so this is how typically a sensor is categorized and we also learned in our earlier uh, exercises that uh, there are physical sensors chemical sensors and biosensors based on what they are really sensing so if there is a physical property like mass or absorbance or pressure or temperature or distance which is being measured you you call it physical sensor when you are able to transform the chemical information into useful signals it's called chemical sensors and if there are recognition elements which recognize only biologically active elements or biological uh, uh, elements uh, so uh, and effectively it measures those elements or the presence of those elements by a chemical change which it transduces into a measurable signal a readable signal it's called a biosensor so typically uh, given this basic definition which is a repeat of some of the earlier work being done what should a sensor have so one of the instances that a sensor should have is that particularly when we talk about the gas sensing business okay or in fact any other sensing business uh, the first important point is the response time that when there is an analyte there is some uh, object which the sensor is worthy of detecting how soon can it provide a transduced uh, signal based on the presence of this analyte so this is one very important aspect the other aspect of course is sensitivity meaning thereby that what is the minimum concentration of the analyte that can generate a signal in this side of the sensor uh, through the transduction process okay uh, which is machine readable so the sensitivity means the lowest analyte that can be sensed or the lowest uh, quantum of the analyte that can be sensed okay by such a sensor then there is also a question of the sensor recovery time particularly in repeatable operations where you are doing multiple sensing you know modules together uh, how soon the element can come to uh, a state which is completely recovered which is uh, completely um, baselined so that the next measurement or next set of measurements can be carried out is the recovery time in gas sensing business is very important that the response time and recovery times are short because uh, we are talking about some kind of an element which changes its properties uh, does some transduction on the presence or absence of certain molecules of gases and the idea is that the molecules would be uh, not there in the system the sensor should be able to recondition itself back to its baseline value and ready for measurement for the next cycle when the molecules are present okay so it's very important that recovery times scales be shorter and then also uh, there is reproducibility which is that in multiple runs uh how good is the signal which is coming out is it going to be similar if similar concentrations of the analytes are explored are there going to be any changes and it really depends on this transduction process and the transducer itself that how that behaves with respect to the presence and absence of an analyte of interest so definitionally the response time is the time taken for uh reaching about 90% of the uh, signal the final signal okay that is uh, that comes out 90% of uh, the signal is corresponding to whatever uh, sensitivity levels are in the particular in, in the in the sensor so if a sensor is able to measure ppm level of uh, gases then the signal which is generated how fast for a certain amount of ppm let's say 100 ppm the signal is able to attain 90% of uh, its quantum and is able to plateau uh, itself is is going to be the response time so in case of sensitivity particularly when we are talking about resistive elements in gas sensing there is a lot of utility of uh, resistive elements which i'll show you in the next slide 
um, there is a percentage change in resistance that we are looking at as the concentration varies. So, supposing uh, we are trying to find this out through a system where we have a carrier gas and uh, the target gas and we make a molar ratio in a manner so that there is the TM level of gas being injected into the system. So, we, we want to find out that from 0 concentration to that maximum PPM level that the gas is supposed to be, what is going to be the percentage change, the electrical change in the uh, sensing element or the transduction element, okay, being, being uh, uh, what percentage change occurs, okay, uh, which, which leads to the enhanced uh, sensitivity, okay, or which, so, so what is the minimum percentage change that is detectable, that is what the idea is. Then we have uh, recovery time which is defined as ability to achieve the initial resistance. So, I told you that it is baselining the sensor. So, if we are talking about resistance as a property which changes, which transduces, it should come back to the baseline level so that it is ready for the next run. And then reproducibility is the ability to retain the sensitivity per cycle. So, whatever is lowest possible value we have been measuring should be repeatably being able to measure and that is how the uh, robustness of the sensor comes into picture. So, in case of uh, gases, it is probably very common to um, achieve gas sensing in terms of hydrogen concentration. Hydrogen is a very uh, inflammable uh, gas and you know uh, there are many systems through which uh, hydrogen systems are carried, uh, hydrogen sensing is carried out. For example, in all the automobile sector, the hybrid vehicles which are having fuel cells would need uh, continuous uh, monitoring of the hydrogen level. Uh, hydrogen level uh, is also being monitored in more or less all modern industrial applications. Hydrogen you know is a clean source of energy for the future, um, for space exploration and nuclear power plants also sometimes hydrogen is used as a fuel and so it is a storage and its reliability in supply and its leakages and the losses therein are very um, highly needed or critically needed to be monitored and analyzed. The, on the top of it, the, the fact remains that for a gas like hydrogen, there are certain properties associated with the gases, which otherwise cannot be detected by uh, normal human presence. For example, the gas is completely colorless or odorless or tasteless and so none of the human senses are able to detect if there is small hydrogen leak. But the, 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 the disadvantage that this hydrogen has is that you know in comparison to some of the other combustible gases like methane, propane or gasoline vapors, hydrogen particularly being lighter in weight also and having a low molecular weight has an unusual combustion characteristics and uh, it gets ignited very fast, a minimum ignition energy needed is only about 0 0.017 millijoule um, and, and thereby uh, it results once it has been ignited in a very, very high heat of combustion and high heat of burning uh, of the extent of about 142 kilojoule per gram and uh, again wide flammable range of 4 to 75 percent. So, when we are talking about sensing, uh, sometimes it is a very common practice uh, as we will see in most of the literature also to start with a gas like hydrogen which is really uh, at the bottom of the, uh, the top of the pyramid in terms of its. Uh, ignitability or in terms of you know the kind of energy release that it would have in terms of the criticality that it might lead it the systems to be in once it leaks in certain systems like that. The other very important point is hydrogen is a highly combustible uh, gas with a um, almost a 4 percent in air being able to explode. Okay, so, only 4 percent uh, by weight hydrogen if present in air is enough, good enough to create um, uh, uh, an explosion. So, it has a comparatively lower explosion limit. So, we are actually doing sensing for something which is needed to have a high sensitivity um, of the sensor system which is investigating uh, this particular gas. Okay. And so, therefore, uh, it is recommended that when a sensor system is designed, um, although the applicability part is in question finally, it may not lead to the detection of hydrogen, but for the acid test and the test of robustness of the center, it is important that such sensor should be amenable to hydrogen testing. So, it basically necessitates uh, hydrogen selective fast speed sensitive sensor technology. Let us look at some of the confluence uh, of technologies uh, which are there. 
So, when we talk about the various uh, associated technologies uh, with respect to hydrogen gas sensing, uh, there are a variety of uh, different transduction options which are there and a lot of devices which generate signals, electrical signals on interaction with hydrogen molecules. For example, look at catalytic sensors, thermal conductivity based sensors, electrochemical sensors, resistance based sensors, work function based sensors and mechanical sensors. These are some of the few most widely used ones when we talk about hydrogen gas detection, particularly in trace levels or in lower concentration levels. So, the catalytic sensors for hydrogen typically means that you are burning hydrogen in the presence of oxygen and measuring the heat release. And so, if we have a standard hydrogen, so basically uh, in this particular case we compare uh, a known concentration of hydrogen and the heat that it releases with respect to the unknown concentration of hydrogen uh, in two different modules here, right here. And with that, we try to look at uh, what is going to be the concentration of hydrogen that is being measured or is there uh, really hydrogen that is being measured or something else. So, these are uh, one set of sensing uh, techniques. The other is again thermal conductivity sensors. Again, the transducer element here is um, measuring the heat loss from a hot body to the surroundings. Uh, there are two different bulbs in this particular case. Uh, one of them is the reference, another is uh, the measurable uh, sample. And we know that thermal conductivity of hydrogen is about 0, 0 0.174 watt per meter Kelvin and that of air is 0 0.024 watt per meter Kelvin. And so, with this in mind, if we are able to measure uh, the thermal conductivity of a certain gas mix, we can see or we can do the bulk modeling to see how much hydrogen is present in what percentage of air and that way we can find out the concentration of the hydrogen. Uh, then there are of course, uh, electrochemical sensors which uh, uh, operate on the basis of electrochemical reactions. Hydrogen is a gas which is bubbled in as you know in a standard hydrogen electrode as well. Uh, and uh, it creates a, a reaction where a one uh, you know decimolar level concentration uh, of, of uh, an electrolyte is maintained, acid electrolyte is maintained with a platinum electrode. And it basically gives out a voltage response of about 4.02 uh, volts. And so, therefore, uh, as the concentration of hydrogen is changed that is bubbled readily through this particular fluid, uh, it shifts the equilibrium to a point where it will start giving even more voltage or lesser voltage and based on that you could see what is the percentage hydrogen in the air that you are sending in. So, in any event hydrogen is being loaded into something and sent. Uh, so, when we are talking about sensing hydrogen in air, uh, basically it is not hydrogen alone, but a lot of other constituents which are present and we are specifically tying to um, customize the response to only the hydrogen which is there and not the other um, molecules which are there. So, therefore, there is an aspect of specificity that how specific a sensor would be in terms of recognizing only one gas over the others. And so, uh, in props in these resistance based sensors which are one of the most widely used sensors particularly when we talk about gas sensing. So, their principle of operation is that in the presence of uh, hydrogen specific change in the resistance happens because of formation of hydrides or states which have uh, a very specific value of resistivity. So, when we are talking about sensing elements like palladium or platinum which are very heavily used for monitoring of hydrogen in the presence of hydrogen they will have the palladium hydride or the plat platinum hydride which actually have uh, different resistivity in comparison to their pure states. And because of that any such resistance change could be calibrated with respect to what is the hydrogen being absorbed on a particular surface. And the absorbed hydrogen is a function of what is there in the ambience or the air around which uh, around around the particular element sensing element. So, there are um, either metallic resistance sensors like palladium and platinum or which uh, work on the basis of surface absorbed hydrogen leading to a change in electrical resistance or uh, there are semiconducting metal oxides like zinc oxide or uh, 
uh, germanium oxide, tungsten oxide, etcetera, which works on the, the principle that there are defect states on these oxides, which would get uh, equilibrated with uh, the hydrogen, uh, because it is reducing in nature. And it will result in the uh, change in the band gap, because the electron um, that is there would be released okay, and uh, the oxygen defect which is present will release an electron will go and react with uh, the reducing gas which is there okay, in the, the ambience. And so, therefore, uh, there is an abundance of one particular charge carrier type in zinc oxide case it is the n type carrier which would suddenly increase and this would lead to a reduction in the resistance because obviously, the mobility and currents are directly related if uh, the charge carriers are more then the mobility of such carriers are also more and it will result in lower resistance in the material semiconducting material. So, these are resistance based sensors there are also work function based sensors um, which consist of three basic layers one let us say is a palladium catalytic metal layer there is an oxide layer and uh, when atomic hydrogen diffuses through the palladium to form a um, dipolar layer, the dipole layer corresponds to a measurable voltage change as can be seen here. This is the metal layer, uh, this is the oxide layer which is there and the metal layer is present over the oxide layer. And we are talking about just a dipole formation uh, due to which uh, there is a change in and the voltages between the metal layer and the oxide layer. There are also mechanical sensors which would be uh, used in doing hydrogen gas sensing. Uh, one of the most important mechanical sensors are micro cantilever sensors, which are based on again the principle of differential surface absorption. So, if you have reactions being carried out on two surfaces with different surface energies sigma 1 and sigma 2. And this sensor will automatically bend because of such a difference according to the theory proposed by Stoney. Uh, and uh, so, this kind of a bend uh, which is probably delta z it can be recorded in terms of a beam which gets deflected from the surface reflected from the surface and such bending of theta would result in finally, a uh, uh, change in the angle of the beam corresponding to 2 theta. Okay. So, uh, definitely the mechanical motion of a cantilever if it can be measured uh, one can find out how good or bad uh, the surface is with respect to uh, hydrogen and some particular specific film which absorbs hydrogen uh, on a very sensitive basis can be suitably applied. So, that the cantilever movement can give you an idea of what is the percentage absorption of the hydrogen on the surface. So, you could tailor this film in a manner so that it does not react or absorb to any other species, but only hydrogen and there are uh, quite a bit of materials which would be very specific to hydrogen and not so specific to other gases uh, which are in picture. And so, when we talk about designing a sensor for any other gas we would need to remember this that in order to address the specificity issue uh, the basic recognition element there which was there in case of hydrogen will need to be changed okay, in if the, if the gas is different. So, that is how different principles are uh, across which gas sensing is carried out. Uh, I will look into a few more slides probably in one of the next lectures, where we will discuss in details about uh, some of the strategies which have been done uh, on a research level by our team as well uh, to design such gas sensors. Uh, in the interest of time, I am going to close this particular module. Thank you very much.